Good afternoon. We will now call to order the policy meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's meeting will include both a policy meeting and a formal meeting of the City Council, but we will begin with our policy meeting. I will call the meeting to order and ask the City Clerk to please call the roll. Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilmember Garcia. Councilmember Garcia. Here. Thank you. Councilwoman Guardado. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Vice Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Thank you all for joining us. Today is a bittersweet day. We celebrate the accomplishments of Councilman Michael Nowakowski and Vice Mayor Thelda Williams, but we also recognize that it is their last policy meeting with this term on the Phoenix City Council. Both of them have served us for multiple terms and have really changed the face of our city. It's wonderful to have a moment to step back and reflect on those accomplishments. Uh, we are also excited to share that in um, honor of the fact that you are both such advocates for our parks department, the uh, council and I, as well as our city staff have made donations in your honor to the Phoenix Parks Foundation. And we hope that that will be one small way to continue to honor your legacy. Um, you both have been such strong advocates whether uh, it be Councilman Nowakowski, making sure our families have places for all ages from amphitheaters to skate parks to more, to Councilman Williams' great legacy, leading a citywide initiative to ensure we have financial support for our parks, as well as also greatly expanding parks in our district. So we hope uh, to continue to honor you through that donation as, as well as many other ways. You both have changed the face of our city. Uh, if we look at uh, Councilman Nowakowski's district, uh, someone who came here when you were sworn in, Councilman, would not recognize our downtown skyline or the, the so many other changes that you have made in your district, whether it's driving along uh, Grand Avenue and seeing that vibrant arts district to Levine being an amazing place with so many more amenities, uh, having been ranked as the number one school, uh, while, during your time as councilman and again uh, the number of farm fields and others that that have changed and councilman Williams has also transformed her district so much addressing difficult infrastructure challenges uh, making it so that it is now adding more finance jobs than Wall Street I mean just things that might have been unthinkable more than a decade ago uh, you both have been passionate about building safer more equitable communities and we want to thank you for for your work uh, in this area. Um, many of the council members uh, have some comments prepared today, and I will turn first to Councilwoman Deborah Stark. Don't you chuckle, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> yeah, I'll first turn to um, Councilman Nowakowski, and I want to thank you for all the amazing work that you have done for not only District 7, but the entire city. The commitment for serving our community certainly shows. You have accomplished so much, and I, I can't list everything, but most notable were your land use planning decisions oh. along the 202 and Ed Pastor Freeway. We worked on those together. The Latino Cultural Center and your commitment to public safety, our downtown and historic preservation. It has been a pleasure to first work for you when I was a planning director and then to work alongside you. It has certainly been a great journey. Um, somehow I know you will remain active in our city and um, I can't wait to see how you will serve us next. It is really an honor to know you. And then I turn to our vice mayor and I also wanna thank you for your devotion to this city to the residents yes. and businesses, and to our animal population. <laughs> no one has looked out for our animals like you. You certainly care about the treatment. 
I consider you a mentor, and I especially want to replicate your calm demeanor on the dais. At the last TI and I meeting, we, the subcommittee members, listed all your accomplishments. There were so many, it would be a novel that would be the size of War and Peace. Seriously, that big. I remember you most for your deep understanding of complex issues like water and aviation infrastructure. I really do consider you a friend for life. Thank you for everything you've done for Phoenix. And you know what? I can't wait until we get another restaurant at Deer Valley Airport so you and I can sit and have a cup of coffee and watch the planes take off. Again, it has just been an honor to know you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark. Uh, Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for that, Mayor. Yeah, I, I mean, as well, um, Michael, you and I have known each other for, for many, many, many years. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you for all of your work, everything that you've done for this amazing city. It was an honor to serve alongside with you for the, for the Latino Cultural Center. I, I think I learned a lot um, from doing that together with you. I thought, I thought it was amazing. Um, there's a lot more work to be done, but definitely you've put your stamp on this city, which is which has been amazing. And I want to thank you for, for all of your help, all of your support along, along the way. Like it's been quite a few you know, I want to say since 2007 that we've, or 2008 that we've known each other. Um, we knew each other, but we didn't know each other, and we've done a lot um, since then. So I want to thank you for all of your hard work all these years. And I know I said this um, to Vice Mayor um, before, but also want to thank you for your advocacy for the airport, um, all the work that we were able to do together um, for the airport workers, like in the, in the last couple of months, I think um, um, the workers appreciate you for, for everything um, that we were able to work on together. And from the bottom of my heart, I wanna thank you as well for all of your help and your support on making sure that we were able to get great things for workers at the airport. And you have my commitment that I will continue to, care, to take care of the airport, I think in the last, Serving with you on the, on the subcommittee was was amazing, and I think I believe that I, I also learned a lot from you doing that. And I can't wait to continue to do great stuff for the, for this airport and and continue to build on on the seats that you that you also planted there. So thank you, thank you so much for everything that you did, and also want to thank the two of you. Thank you, Mayor. Well said, Councilwoman. Mayor? Councilman DeCizio. Thank you, Eric. Don't really have anything prepared. I've just known these two individuals for some time. Zelda I've known now since the 90s. And I think a lot of us get judged by, you know, what we think are accomplishments on in government. But at the end of the day, you know, those are all written things. The things that are not written are the things that how we treat our family and how we literally live our lives. And I've known Zelda, and you can be judged by, you know, if we're going to be judged as individuals. Time goes by quickly. Uh, time on the counseling goes by quicker. But we are judged by how our families are. And Zelda was always a, an amazing individual with her family. All you have to do is look at her family and her children and all those that have surrounded her. I think you're, like, I don't know how many grandkids you have, but you have a few. And... Those are the things that we will eventually be judged by. With Michael, I mean, Michael and I should be the example of how bipartisanship really works. Michael and I did not like each other at the very beginning of this. Matter of fact, uh, we didn't like each other at all. I won't use the other words of how we felt about each other, but we've grown to have a relationship that was beyond the council and one that turned into a friendship. Um, and the way I look at Michael, I don't look at all the things that he was able to accomplish, which are quite a bit for the city of Phoenix. But what he was able to accomplish as a father, as a husband, as a son, you just have to see his relationship with his dad and how he treats his father and 
that tells you a lot about how an individual treats his family. And he's one of the others, other than myself, you would see Michael bring his kids to events. You know, he brought them to the council meeting. In fact, I had even some of the editorial writers say, wow, it was just amazing to see Michael Nowakowski bring his son with him to uh, one of the editorial board meetings. And had one of them bring that up. So that, I think, at the end of the day, is how we judge individuals, or at least how I think that we should judge them, is how they treat their family, how their family turns out. I mean, I don't think you've ever seen any more respectful kids seeing Michael's kids. And that tells you the type of father that he is, the type of wife that Dahlia is, because nothing can be done without a strong and supportive spouse that Michael has had. Dahlia has been an amazing woman. Um, just an incredible woman. And Michael, you've been very blessed in your life multiple times with those kids of yours. Matter of fact, I think I knew you only had three kids. And now I think, what are we up to now, Michael? Five? And but that tells you the type of man that he really is. And it's been a blessing to work with you both. Uh, a blessing to get to know you both on a personal level. Because at the end of the day, I think that's more important. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman DeCicio. And we welcome members of our elected officials, families who are with us today and thank them for sharing uh, your loved ones with the city of Phoenix, supporting them as they served and, and making them stronger public servants as well. We've loved having family members on the way and both Councilman Nowakowski and Councilwoman Williams come from families that are committed to this city and, and have made it better. So thank you to those family members. I'll turn to Councilwoman Laura Pastor. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to say, well, Felda, uh, we spoke at TII, so I have, you know, great admiration for you. Uh, you did watch me. I was reflecting back during this time, and I remember you you have seen me grow uh, from a child to where I am today because of uh, my father's involvement in politics. So, uh, I, I totally missed that piece. So yes, I'm still a rambunctious child, still going to give uh, my opinion and still will, will cause a little trouble. What's life all about without trouble? So I think I take some of that personality from you. You're just now uh, at, at this moment, you hide it a little, little bit better, but uh, I don't think the city would have be where it is today if you hadn't had that and had that spirit. So I really appreciate everything you've done and given to the city, along with the sacrifices that your family has also given. And uh, as Sal said, yes, your family had always been number one. And so I uh, really appreciate uh, you and uh, everything you have done. We will continue, maybe not at this, uh, in this moment in junction, but we will continue with our uh, dialogue and friendship and always wish you the best and your family the best. Um, as for Michael, I've known Michael for a very long time. Um, as same, same with uh, Councilwoman Williams, but uh, Michael and I have shared many, many paths and commitments to our community. One thing that Michael has not swayed from was always his faith, his family and his community. And so I appreciate and thank you and I'm grateful for the accomplishments that you have done and the doors that you've opened for others uh, to enter uh, politics and also uh, be able to serve on committees and provide a voice for them. So thank you, Michael, for doing that. Uh, it is correct that Delia is the rock uh, that keeps the family solid and strong and also keeps you on your toes and, uh, and uh, assists in making some decisions. So I appreciate that and appreciate all your family and what the compliment, accomplishments they have done along with you. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll go next, uh, Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll start with Alda, I think something that Sal said rings true to me about bipartisanship. Felda 
you're a staple of the city and I, I feel like I've grown up seeing you at the city. Um, I'm going to miss the chats we had outside the building. A um, couple of things you did in the last in the last you know year and a half that I've been there that, I, that I'll remember and that show kind of the bipartisanship and and the way you were you were willing to work with people um, even outside of your district. The the trauma uh, committee that you worked on that's now now you know move forward the 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 work hopefully will be moving on this year with the, the alternatives and the mental health providers to to support law enforcement and the community. Um, and then the moment where, you know, as a council, uh, we weren't able to move forward uh, to have uh, the undocumented community um, be be able to obtain the, the CARES Act funds. And true to your word, you, you fundraised and supported the undocumented fund uh, for always be you know, having grown up undocumented and having and still having undocumented family, I'll always be thankful for for that and in your work. Um, also, your sense of style. I think we all know um, that, you know, it was always the conversation of the outfits you were wearing and and how great you look. Thank you so much for for always being yourself and, and being bright and and, and cheery. Um, so we're going to miss you um, to Michael. Michael, we've known each other for a long time. I still remember the day, I think I was 22, 23 years old. I was in college when we were doing a get out the vote event when you told me there was no Latinos on council and you had been supporting us with, you know, the, the, the big marches through the campesina and all that stuff. You always answered your call, you know, before I was on council, anything we needed, you were there. Um, you know, this last year missed you both. We weren't able to see each other too much because of the pandemic, but you know, hopefully we'll we'll be able to to continue in your footsteps. And if you ever need anything from us, myself, you know, offering myself, uh, please feel free to call. And and the same like all others, please thank your families. Um, you know, Delia, for sharing Michael with us for such a long time. Um, I know it's hard work, both your community work and also. Um, the, the kids, so thank you all so much and and enjoy the time off. Thank you so much. Uh, certainly well said and, and we recognize that that both of the council people we are. Recognizing today we're trailblazers, so it is cool to to think the history you have helped the city make. I will turn to Councilman Jim Waring. Mayor. Uh, I don't have a ton to add to what's already been said, all of which I thought was uh, was incredibly appropriate. First off, hats off to Carlos for mentioning uh, Thelda's style points. I think that's uh, awesome that that got mentioned. I probably wouldn't have thought of it, but I should have, and I'm glad somebody got to it first. Uh, Michael, um, uh, one thing I, I have to say, what I appreciate about you is uh, actually extremely selfish. Uh, it is your unfailing good cheer. So. Uh, I, I would always, and we were just chatting, we were both in the office, uh, uh, day the office was closed, Cedar Chavez Day, and uh, even then, just just always chipper, always um, uh, with a chuckle, a quiet chuckle. I, I just love that. We didn't talk and work together as much as maybe some others, but um, when we did, we always had long conversations, and I always learned something from them, and I also always got a different point of view uh, from those conversations, and I appreciate it. Whereas you were probably just praying to get me off the phone. So, but I, uh, I, I took a lot away from that. I enjoyed it. I will miss it, but I would be happy to hear from you anytime, even though we want us to be working in the uh, offices uh, next to each other uh, from here on out. Uh, but I, I would love to hear from you anytime. And I really enjoyed our relationship. I think we worked together on uh, uh, some projects that were important to the city and I'm glad we got those done. Uh, Thelda, uh, one of my favorite times being an elected official, which expands some number of years now, was being your vice mayor. I enjoyed that thoroughly. Uh, I thought we got a lot done. I thought we had fun doing it. I thought everything ran pretty well, uh, even if it was just a temporary assignment for the both of us. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. We hadn't worked together as much uh, before you were mayor, but uh, I just, uh, I thought you were a hoot 
which is a uh, term of great endearment in the wearing family, whether it is more broadly recognized outside the Midwest, I don't know. But uh, but I can assure you, uh, knowing you've got Iowa roots, you, you're probably familiar with it. I, I just always got a kick out of working with you. Um, I'll really miss you. Uh, I know you've got an extremely capable successor who I do know a little bit, but, uh, but you will not be forgotten at all. And uh, uh, I, I just, I really thought, particularly during that period, we, we got stuff done. I really appreciated your civic mindedness. You are really into uh, working for the city and uh, you have no pretensions. I remember very distinctly the first time we actually met uh, because it was at my swearing in and it was kind of rushed because I won a special election. So, you know, there wasn't this long period between election and uh, swearing in. So it was just a few days and I was very much a city outsider. And uh, I, I went to my own inaugural and uh, this nice lady came over and said, hi. I said, hi, I'm Jim. And there was a pause and she looked at me and she said, I'm Felda. So I appreciated that you didn't just smack me for being so stupid. <laughs> but I was just telling that story to somebody the other day. So I remember that very well. And I appreciate your graciousness at that very awkward moment. Uh, caused by my stupidity, and uh, but I have I've enjoyed uh, being friends with you, and I hope that continues. Uh, you know, I I'd love to see you back at City Hall under any any circumstance and occasion, and I just uh, wanted you to know that uh, at least in the District Two office and for me personally, you'll very much be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, we will turn to Councilwoman Williams and Nowakowski in a moment, but first, our City Manager has a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's great to follow these memories of city council members who've worked with you. And I just wanted to say that on behalf of 15,000 city employees, I want to thank both Council Member Williams and Council Member Nowakowski for their service to the city over the last 13 years. And in Felda's case, for many years actually before the last 13. I want to extend also my personal thanks to both of them for their dedicated service. Uh, you know, I, I know Michael, have worked with Michael now in his 13 years, and he always, uh, always included city employees. He always talked about Team Phoenix and the Team Phoenix approach to things, which I thought really captured what we try to, to embody here as city employees. Uh, and he always, as was noted before, always with a laugh and a smile and a sense of humor. Um, in, in, with both of them actually, you know, some personal memories is uh, spending time with Michael at the cow milking contest at Levine Days. Uh, he beat me in, in that. And um, also, Michael roped me one year into judging the tamale contest at the Food City Cinco de Mayo Festival. And uh, that was a, a new experience for a guy from Kansas to judge tamales. I'm not sure I was the greatest judge, but I really enjoyed uh, all the different tastes. So thank you for that, Michael. And with Felda, uh, one of my great memories will be uh, the water slide race at the grand opening of the Cortez Park uh, pool, which she won. Uh, and uh, so that was a lot, a lot of fun. But on a more serious note, as I said, a great thanks to Councilman Nowakowski for always celebrating Phoenix employees at, as Team Phoenix. Great thanks to Councilwoman Williams for her always being caring of city employees, her love of animals, and her love of the kids, especially the kids in her district. And so a, a good memory of the Cortez pool, but that Cortez pool was such a labor of love for Councilwoman Williams because she knew how important it was to the children in District 1. And to Councilman Nowakowski, who knew how important the Cesar Chavez Community Center, which will open this fall, how important that was to the children of District 7 and 8. And so I wanna thank you both for the maturity and humor that you brought to the serious business of running the fifth largest city in the United States. And thank you. And so we have about a, a minute and a half of video clips that our communication office has put together as a little retrospective. Uh, we think it'll show, uh, as was noted before, great style for both of them. So with that, we'll roll a short video.
Thank you, Mayor, and I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you to our communications team for putting together that great, great video. I will now turn to Vice Mayor Williams. You're going to make me cry. Thank you so much for all the kind words and all your support over the years. I'll tell you, 12 years or 13 years goes by in the blink of an eye. But I'm very proud to have served with each and every one of you. We made progress and that's what's important. Keep moving Phoenix ahead. I think Phoenix is the best city in the world. And it's because of our community. It's because of our leaders. So I encourage you to continue upward and onward. There's a lot of challenges ahead, but I have great confidence that you will be able to move us forward. And Ed, I want to thank you very much for losing on the slide. Staff gave me the one they knew went quicker than the one they gave him. But it has been an exciting adventure and I uh, appreciate everything that you're doing and the challenges that you have already talked about and the ones that will be appearing on your screen for the years over. So thank you all. And thank you, Michael. I've enjoyed working with you even when I saw you holding the horse. So <laughs> I, I will always remember that day. So, and I always remember when we brought in the little pony down to ch council chambers and he gifted the city manager at that time with green apples. So it's been an adventure. I've loved every minute of it, well, almost every minute of it. And uh, I just wish you all the very, very best. And I'm so thankful to have had this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilman Nowakowski. Oh, that was great, Vice Mayor. You know, it, it is like a blink of an eye, 13 years, just like that. And it was, it's been a privilege serving with all of my colleagues, you know. We shared a lot of good times together, a few hard times here and there, but we had a lot of blessings, a lot of blessings to ourselves and a lot of people out there. You know, during this, this COVID-19, we were able to really help a lot of people out from the homeless to people that lost their jobs, that were trying to just survive from one rent to another. And I just really wanna thank you all for really thinking about those individuals out there in our community that are the real needy of the needy, you know? And it's been a journey with our staff. I mean, all 15,000 of our staff members that work really hard to make us all look good. And, you know, it's really a team approach and I always use that Team Phoenix because I really believe in that. I believe as long as we work together as a team, everything's possible. And, you know, it's, it's, it's been that way. I mean, look at downtown. When I first started, there was this idea of creating ASU downtown, and now it's just, we have an international school now, you know, Thunderbird International School in downtown Phoenix. I mean, Michael Crow, I'm not sure what he's going to come up with next, but we're open and ready for any, any big surprises like that. And just the downtown, I mean, from Chris Mackey calling downtown hot, I believe the whole city of Phoenix is hot. It's incredible, you know, from those individuals that advocated for a freeway down in the Levine area in the Estrella Mountain area, the 202, you know, the Congressman Pastor uh, freeway. I mean, it was just, we, we actually did a campaign. We raised money. We came up with a slogan, build that darn freeway. And we created green shirts and we organized and we went to the Civic Plaza where they were having a federal um, hearing on it and we loaded up buses and buses and buses of individuals. So, you know, that's really changing um, the individuals one person at a time organizing, um, you know, so thank you to all those um, individuals out there with those crazy ideas, right? Um, those crazy ideas like blight, um, blight busters, you know, somebody goes, well, what can we do with our neighbors with all this high grass and signs and junk? Can we actually help the city give out citations? I go, well, let's find out. At first it was a no, no, and hell no. And then finally it became a yes. And we finally created the flight busters and all those great volunteers that are out there protecting their neighborhoods and making sure that their neighborhoods are, are clean and stuff. So thank you all and all the staff members that made that happen. And with our great downtown, we need a great park. And with the Margaret Hands Park, I mean, it's just a miracle how people are coming together, fundraising, 
now we have a whole playground with the Fiesta Bowl. It's just people, it's a destination point. It's every great city has a great gathering place and um, Margaret Hans Park is our gathering place. I just really wanna thank you all that participated in that. And you know, one of the programs we were talking about, my, the mayor and myself is our Take Back Our Neighborhood program. When I first came into office, we were having some conflicts with the um, black and brown gangs that were in, in South Phoenix. And then we came up with the concept of bringing in the churches and the neighborhoods and the businesses and the schools and everybody together and take back our neighborhood. And from there, uh, so, um, Lindo Park just expanded, and, you know, thanks to the county and the city. And back then, my chief of staff, Ruben Gallegos, that probably spent a lot of time in Lindo Park away from his wife at that time. Uh, and the mayor was a a volunteer because um, she was kind of married into District 7 at that time. And, you know, thank you, Mayor, for all those great inputs that she put in to make that. Um, you weren't even a council member at that time to make uh, take back our neighborhood possible. And, you know, just all the mom and pop businesses that believe in Phoenix that opened up here, all those entrepreneurs, all of our staff members that come up with these crazy ideas. And you had a crazy council member that said, yeah, let's do it. And, you know, it's just incredible what we were able to do. You know, Sal was joking around that I had, um, I actually had four children when I started the console, and now I have six. You know, um, Raymond was born actually on my first meeting, my first console meeting. I had a, I was just elected and I had to um, miss my first console meeting because my son was being born. So I called um, the mayor, Phil Gordon, and go, um, Mayor, I can't make it to my first meeting. What do you mean you can't make it to your first meeting? This is important. We're going to introduce you. I go, um, my wife's pregnant and we're having a son right in a couple hours. Oh, no, no, no. You take care of your family needs. So, you know, that's something just amazing how two of my my children have been involved with the city of Phoenix from, from the very beginning. You know, Anke was born in my second term. And, you know, it's just amazing what your parents have taught you to become servant leaders and how you can teach others to become servant leaders also. And that's the magic of all those individuals that volunteered or worked in, in the city of Phoenix that have gone on to do bigger and better things. And it's just amazing that uh, how blessed we are. And, you know, um, I, I had lunch the other day with um, Yasmin and, you know, we were just talking and she said, Michael, if I have any questions, can I come and ask you? And I go, absolutely. I know District 7 is going to be left with her, a great councilwoman that is not afraid to call and ask for help. So, you know, I hope she takes me up on that offer and we're here to support you and make sure things are, are going good. But I remember one thing she talked about, she said, you know, what was one of the good times in District 7? And I think it was, um, and it, I kind of hesitated on it, but it's really looking at your siblings, looking at, and when I talk about my siblings, it's not just my brother, Martin, Rosa and Monica, but it's all my um, brother-in-laws. I have eight um, brother, um, four brother-in-laws and four sister-in-laws that have been a part of this journey from the very beginning. And when you look at them in an audience and when they, they feel proud and they smile back and, and they say, that's my brother-in-law, that's, you know, it makes you feel good. It makes you feel complete. It makes you feel that you did something good, not just for the Nowakowski family, but also the Ortega family. And then she, um, Yasmin also asked me, what was one of the hardest times as a council member? And um, as I think now, the hardest time was my second um, inauguration because my mother on New Year's Eve, she had an aneurysm and we rushed her to the, um, to the um, hospital. And then um, we were there at St. Joseph's Hospital and uh, I was getting calls if I was gonna come and do the inauguration or not. And I, I didn't want to do it because my mom was there and well, in her deathbed, and I just felt bad. And all my sisters and brothers and brother-in-laws and family, nope, you're getting out of this room because we know that if your mother could speak, that she would want you to go. And I think that was probably the hardest thing um, as a council member. I think Laura and, and Thelda could probably um, attest to that. Um, having your number one cheerleader not there no more. So, you know, that's probably the biggest thing. And I always have her with me right here, you know, watching over me. And then I had a support with oh, Mrs. Ortega. 
and then she passed away this year. So it's a hard year, you know, and not just for the Ortegas and the Alcosti family, but all those people that have lost loved ones because of COVID. And I just really want to thank my colleagues for um, their support and making it easy to deal with losing a loved one. And for all those thousands of people that have lost their loved ones or they're going through losing their jobs or so, I just really want to thank our staff and our council members for approving all those great programs and helping those individuals out during the hard times. And I feel really comfortable that we're leaving you guys, the city of Phoenix in good hands, that these individuals are, are great to work with. Sometimes they're hard headed on certain issues, but they always have what's best, the city of Phoenix in their hearts and soul. So I'm gonna miss you all. It's been great serving you. Um, my dad always said to be successful in life is to have God first, your family second, and your community third and I follow those steps and I believe that I became very successful by following those three steps. So thank you pops, love you. And I just really need to say, I love my kids, all six of them, uh, five boys and one girl and they've gone from cleanups to, I think they think it's the way of life. It's, it's not an obligation, it's just a way of life that you have to help out your neighbor and be involved in the community and especially my wife Delia. I mean I couldn't imagine what I where I would be right now without her um you know it's her support walking beside me I remember when Helen Chavez passed away Paul Chavez basically talked about his mother saying you know everybody would say behind a strong man is a strong woman he said no my mother always always walked on the side of my father and they worked together to make things happen. And I believe the same thing here is that Delia is always on my side, always walking with me, kind of telling me what to do most of the time. And I think that's what a partnership is all about. So I love you babes, love you kids, and thank you guys for the opportunity and the honor to serve as a council member for the city of Phoenix. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski. Powerful words. Uh, I now turn, uh, Council Vice Mayor Williams is, is not done with her official duties yet, and I will turn to her for a call for executive session. Oh, sure, I'm about ready. <laughs> okay, I move the City Council to meet an executive session pursuant to Arizona Revised Statute Section 38-431.03A on Wednesday, April 21st, 2021 at 1 p.m. Phoenix City Hall, 200 West Washington, Phoenix, Second. Arizona, in an online meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed, please signal nay. Passes unanimously. Before we move to the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council, does our city manager have any additional reports or updates? Mayor, no, I do not have any today, although it's my understanding that there may be a council member with, uh, with non uh, related to the, the previous one's uh, requests. Excellent, any council member business? Speaking about policy, I mean, our updates, or what are we speaking about? Councilwoman Pastor. Okay. I think they have my slides. Am I correct? Yes, Councilwoman Pastor, they do. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to share District 4 updates. Uh, first, I want to I want to invite District 4 residents to join us for a virtual uh, community coffee uh, Tuesday, April 20th from 8 to 9 a.m. And you can contact our office for more information. You don't have to worry about it, Ed. I'll just continue. I, I apologize. I don't. I think we slides, didn't get them loaded. Oh, God. I you want apologize, me to wait Councilwoman. Again? Yes, go ahead. I, I apologize. We didn't get them loaded. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Worked really hard on that. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, 
Now I'd like to take a moment to show a little community appreciation, but uh, I will just first say, uh, first I'm grateful for the Sit and Say Steal, our homeless dog shelter, which will be opening next month on May 1st. We will be holding an open house from 8.30 to 11 a.m. So Thelda, come join us. Uh, we'll be showing off the facility with our partners, uh, Midwestern and Humpaki Farms. I'm also grateful to Jim Swanson and the water department for offering water meter reading class to Lazy Days mobile home residents. They really enjoy the fact that they now know how to read their meter, meter and there is some metering there that, I, that we figured out. Uh, finally, I'm grateful for the fire department for giving muscular dystrophy the boot. For over, 20, for over 67, Phil the boot has been a strong firefighter tradition. It has given families with muscular dystrophy in hometowns across America hope for the future and support for today. Every boot drive helps families with muscular dystrophy in your community by funding research for new treatments, supporting MDA care centers, and sending kids to the MDA summer camp. In 2019, the United Phoenix Firefighters Association raised $217,000 for the MDA. And lastly, I would like to wish everyone a happy Ramadan. As always, stay, stay in the know with District 4 by following us on social media. Thank you, Mayor and my colleagues. Those are my updates. Thank you, Thank you. Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to just remind folks, um, we're gonna having our bilingual um, budget budget hearing um, this Thursday. Um, we wanna thank all of our neighborhood leaders and community members that have already participated. Um, this Thursday, the meeting, will, like I said, will be bilingual. I encourage everyone to attend, to hear more about this year's budget and to speak about where do you think our, sh our city should invest? And want to make sure to remind folks um, that even though I know the thing that everyone is doing is getting the vaccine, we just want to remind everyone that we still have a stationary site at the Maryville Park, 4420 North 51st Avenue, Mondays and Saturdays from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. It offers the PCR test with results within, within 24 hours. So anyone that's still looking, for a COVID test, um, facility is still open um, to be able to do that. And then on Saturday, we're going to have a drive up testing site at St. Simon and Jude Catholic Church, 6531 North 27th Avenue from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mayor. Councilwoman Pastor. So Michael, I don't know if you can see this, but as you know, I'm moving to your office and as I'm cleaning, I have uh, the Cesar Chavez Foundation builder uh, <laughs> and Cisa uh, Pueda. So I think it's fitting for what we'll be doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. With that, we will Call to order the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilmember Garcia. Here. Councilwoman Guardado. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Here. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Vice Mayor Williams. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Thank you. Welcome to our April 13th formal meeting. Our first agenda item is uh, one that uh, recognizes someone who helped build our country and our community. And it is agenda item uh, led by Councilman Nowakowski with support of the council members uh, whose district are impacted and I will pass the um, torch to Councilman Nowakowski to introduce this item. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mayor. And um, what Cesar Chavez, I mean, Cesar has done so much for our community. 
from the civil rights movement to fasting here at Santa Rita Hall in Phoenix, Arizona. I remember um, when I was smaller, I was a young kid, about 13 years old, just running around and and being a part of the that fast. And um, Caesar would give reports, or somebody would go and talk to Caesar Chavez every evening. And right after mass, they would give us a report of what's going on, what Caesar's conditions are, and all that. And I remember one day that Dolores Huerta comes out and says, "You know, people are saying can no se puede. That's not possible here in Arizona." And but Caesar says, "Si se puede, si se puede en Arizona. That yes, it can be done." And that phrase has gone from rallies to marches to soccer, football games that you hear that si se puede all over the place. It was actually right here, coined just not that far from, from City Hall. So Cesar Chavez has had such an impact in our community, especially in Arizona. He was born here in Arizona and he actually passed away here um, on April 23rd. And I think that one of the things that I wanted to do, because um, when I was younger, I was eight years old when I first met Cesar Chavez, and I had the honor and the privilege in college to drive him around from one meeting to another or once one speech to another. And I remember one time driving down Baseline Road and right there on 35th Avenue, there was like 40 acres of land. And he was telling me in California that they have 40 acres of land. And what he would like to do is to create a community center, a center that if people need help, finding a job, if they need immigration, social services, that it was a one stop for all. And at the same time on the weekends, a place to celebrate weddings and baptisms and quinceaneras. So that never happened. Um, we never ended up purchasing that piece of property. But years later, there was a park that said a future park. And when people were trying to convince the city council to name um, 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 Patriot Square after Cesar Chavez, they asked my opinion. I said, well, he would really like to be out there where the farmers are. And at that time, you had all kinds of flower groves and, and, and fields out in South Phoenix. And that's where we named Cesar Chavez Park. After that, a high school is named after him, a library. And now we have a, a big community center. It's just amazing what's happening in honor of Cesar Chavez right there on Baseline Road. So when we met with different community leaders um, from Levine, where we met with um, Shannon Richmond from the um, um, president of the um, uh, Arlington Estates on Block Watch and Fern that runs the Levine Baseball. And then I spoke to the um, County Board of Supervisor, Steve Gallardo, that represents that area. He was saying, you know, Michael, between Baseline and, and Buckeye, we should name it after Baseline. So we all agreed that Baseline was the place and continue meeting with individuals like Adelinda and AP from Arizona, um, um, Arizona and um, David Adam and others. And they all were saying, you know, Baseline would be the place for him. That's where the fields were. That's where individuals worked. And as the city of Phoenix grows, we need to remember those individuals that put food on our table and that worked very hard. And at the same time, we need to recognize the Latino leaders that use nonviolence as a way to make change through fasting and, and creating a boycott on, on grapes to educate people how pesticides don't only kill those individuals that are working in the field, but affect those individuals that consume it also. So it's just an honor and a privilege, not only to, to be able to work for a foundation that's founded by Cesar Chavez, not only by having him as a friend and a mentor, but now being able as a council member um, to name a street uh, that's named after him, a, a, a location where people come and celebrate uh, where people can come and drive and their children can say, who was that Cesar Chavez? And people can learn about that story. So his legacy lives on forever. And I think it's so important that we recognize an American hero, but an Arizona, Arizonian hero, 
a person that made change here in Phoenix with just with that CISA play slogan pointing it here in, the, in our city. So with that, I really like to uh, make a motion and um, to, to name Baseline Road, um, Cesar Chavez Boulevard, and that would extend all the way from from 75th Avenue to 48th Street. And maybe in the future we can work to get our our brothers, sisters, our brothers, our sister city, Tempe and Mesa to do the same. And we'll have all the way down through Tempe and Mesa in the future as a Caesar Chavez Boulevard. So that's Second. Second. thank you. And Mayor, just one last comment. It's so hard to summarize who Cesar Chavez was, but um, working for the Chavez Foundation, one of the things that I've learned is that every time we have a meeting, every time we get together as a radio sales meeting, or if it's a immigration reform meeting, or if it's a, a sales meeting or a housing meeting, we always start off with the um, farm worker prayer. And what this prayer is really all about, it's really the mission and vision of the Cesar Chavez movement, all in a prayer form. So I just like to read it off really quick and take the privilege to do that because I believe it's a way of life and it's not just a prayer, it, it's a meditation and it's an example of how we as individuals should, should live our lives. And it goes, and I'll, 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 I'll just read it off really quick here. It goes, um, show me the suffering of the most miserable so I would know my people's plight. Free me to pray for others, for you are present in every person. Help me take responsibility for my own life so I can be free at last. Grant me the courage to serve others, for in service there is true life. Grant me honesty and patience, for in service there is true life. Bring forth song and celebration so that the spirit will never will live among us let the spirit flourish and grow so that we'll never tire of this struggle. And let us remember those who have fought for justice, for they will never give up on their life. Help us love even those who hate us so that we can change the world. Amen. And I think that last phrase of help us love even those who hate us so that we can change the world, I think that's so important. And I believe that that's what we try to do as council members. We try to change the city of Phoenix one person at a time, even though you have people yelling at you and screaming at you, but we try to bring people together and figure out what that common ground is. And from there, the conversation or what I call the miracle begins. So with that, I'm honored and privileged and thank you, Laura, for seconding um, that motion. Thank you, Mayor. Wonderful. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski, for making sure our city celebrates the legacy of Cesar Chavez and thank you Councilman Pastor for your second. Um, do, and did you want to mention anything about funding source for the project? I think um, absolutely Mayor. So basically this the funding is going to be approximately about $800 for each intersection and we have about 23 different intersections which will be about $17,000, $17,200 and each council member, we are actually privileged of having some funding that we can use for different projects within the within our districts. So I'm going to be using those um, funds that we have um, allocated to us. Those, um, I believe it's called. What are they? I forgot what the participatory budget. Yes, that's it. To, to use towards this, and I think it'll be a great way to. Um, have a legacy of an individual that did so much for Arizona and Phoenix and for the future um, generations to basically use his practices to bring people together in a peaceful way. Thank you. Uh, beautifully said. Thank you, Councilman. I will next turn to Deputy City Manager Mario Paniagua to present the item. And then we have two members of the public to testify, including Alejandro Chavez, grandson of Cesar Chavez. Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, for, for your words and for your introduction. Um, what, a, what a great presentation. Actually, a lot of the things that um, we've got to present here, you, you covered and you talked about 
um, in a much better way than, than we could um, with your firsthand knowledge uh, of Cesar Chavez. But we're very thankful to be here this afternoon, very excited about this item, um, and honored to be here on this day celebrating um, uh, Cesar Chavez and also honoring you, Councilman Nowakowski, uh, for your term, and you, Vice Mayor Williams. Again, thank you for all you've done and the great work that, you, that you've done for our community. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to this presentation on our extremely important figure in our country's rich Latino history, Cesar Chavez. Um, but first, a little bit about what ceremonial signs are. Uh, just a reminder for our council and for members of our community. We've done this kind of a ceremonial recognition in the past. Uh, you're familiar with Broadway Road and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard ceremonial signs that have been placed there. That was uh, an action taken by the council. And ceremonial signs are a way that we can honor and recognize individuals, uh, nonprofit organizations, events, national figures, or landmarks, uh, and so we've been able we, we've been able to do that in the past, and we're very uh, grateful for the opportunity to do that here. All of these ceremonial signs require city council approval before doing those. Uh, with that, I I do have a little bit of information about Cesar Chavez, much of which uh, Councilman Nowakowski talked about the fact that he was born here in Arizona and Yuma. Uh, many Phoenicians are, are very familiar with the date of March 31st uh, because that was his birthday that, in 1927 and it's a day that's a uh, celebrated as a holiday here by the city of Phoenix. Um, and then uh, 28 years ago this month actually uh, in 1993 he passed away. Uh, during his life though he accomplished a great deal. Um, as Councilman Nowakowski talked about, labor leader, civil rights activist, uh, dedicated to the struggle of the farm workers and improving their working conditions and their living conditions and his nonviolent approach uh, to fighting for their rights. Uh, Cesar Chavez founded the National Farm Workers Association, which, was, which later became the United Farm Workers, and the Santa Rita Hall that uh, Councilman Nokowski mentioned was the headquarters, uh, and that is where that, that fast occurred. Here you see a picture of, of Cesar Chavez with Coretta Scott King, during the fast uh, that was underway um, while it was happening. Um, and so uh, it, it was uh, a quite, a, quite an event where he was uh, protesting um, a state bill that was restricting collective bargaining in Arizona. Uh, a year after his death, uh, Cesar Chavez was awarded the posthumous, posthumously the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Bill Clinton. Here you see a picture of uh, Helen Chavez receiving that award from, from the president at that time. And uh, just a recap of, of Baseline Road and, and everything that's there. Uh, Councilman, you described this very well. We've got the park, uh, the, the high school, the library, and the soon to open community center all right there along Baseline Road. Really appreciate the additional uh, perspective that you gave us on that with your history with him. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keeney Knudsen to talk a little bit more in detail about the installation of the signs. Thank you, Mario. Mayor, members of council, as Mario mentioned, the recommendation for the ceremonial street names, renaming of Baseline Road is along its length through the city limits. Um, it, it does stretch from 75th Avenue to 48th Street, and with ceremonial street renaming, like major arterials like this on Baseline Road, the new signs are placed at signalized intersections only, and there are 23 signalized intersections along this stretch. The recommended ceremonial street name is Cesar Chavez Boulevard. You can see a mock-up of the sign on the screen. I know all signs uh, look smaller in the air, but in proper perspective, this is about two and, a half, two and a half feet tall, two feet tall, and about seven and a half feet long. The ceremonial sign will have blue background and white lettering. From the mock-up on the previous slide, the next photo shows on the screen depicts how the sign would look installed in an actual intersection. And this is not just any intersection. This is the entrance to Cesar Chavez High School at 39th Avenue. You can see the blue sign appears below the baseline road street sign. At each, signalized at each signalized intersection, these signs would be installed on both the north and south sides of the intersection. The photo on the screen now shows a zoomed in view of that same sign at the intersection. If council approves this action today, the next question is, is when will these signs be ready to be installed? Based on the number of signs and the length of the corridor, we estimate that our street transportation crews will be able to fabricate and install all signs by the middle of May. 
Now, uh, I know Councilman Nowkowski talked a little bit about the cost. The cost to fabricate and install those signs is about $800 per intersection, and the total estimated cost is $17,200. So the recommendation before Council, as um, already been uh, motioned and seconded, is to approve the installation of the ceremonial street name signage uh, recognizing Cesar Chavez along Baseline Road at signalized intersections across the city of Phoenix limits. This concludes our presentation, and Mario and I would be happy to answer any questions the Council may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. We will now go to uh, testimony from members of the public, rec uh, beginning with a member of the Chavez family, Alejandro Chavez, followed by Mark Rodriguez. Hi, thank you, Mayor uh, and Council, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, I live in Phoenix, proud resident, proud resident of District 7. And, uh, you know, I think this is not just important to myself as a family member, which of course I'm biased, so I do believe it is, mm -hmm. uh, but I believe it's important to all the families that grow up and have grown up along baseline. You know, uh, I've heard a lot here about family and how important it is. And, you know, when my grandfather and my grandmother's uh, work was about, was about giving farm worker children the same opportunity as everyone else's children. Same opportunity as growers' children. And it didn't matter if you were a CEO or a farm worker, if you work hard, you should be able to have the same opportunities and for sure your children should. And when you look along baseline, all you start to see now are those people who are just one, two, um, maybe some people still are farm workers or come from farm workers. Um, even looking on this council, you have people that are one, two generations away from farm workers. And my grandfather's work was always about making it better opportunity, uh, whether it be making opportunity for women in the movement, LGBTQ rights, whether it was fighting for voting rights, whether it was fighting for labor rights, environmental rights. It was always about the people. Uh, Councilman Nowakowski uh, mentioned about how people will ask him, uh, what's something about Cesar that people will remember, or how would you describe him? I always describe him as a farm worker. No matter what he did, he took great pride in it. If you looked at how he dressed, uh, Many people offered to buy him nice clothes and suits to meet presidents, but he didn't because he believed that the way he dressed and the way that he was presenting himself was how farm workers would it. And I think that when you look along the baseline, you see working class community who can take pride in how they dress. You don't have to be wearing a suit. These are not all people who wear suits to work. Some do, many don't. And it's okay to take pride in that. Um, and that's where I think a lot of this is not just about my family, but all the families. You know, CSEP weather was coined here, but they were just words until the people of Phoenix started to uplift it in energy and make it happen and turn those words into a movement. And those people are still there today. This is 1972. We're not talking in the 50s <laughs> by any means. And so when you look at baseline, whether you go Levine, South Phoenix, or all the way over towards the, the, the Awatuki side, you see people that still reflect that working class. People that have struggled in the movement, people that have struggled daily, and people that have prevailed, even if they were just one generation away from farm workers. So I think passing this will represent all those families and people over the years that have been farm workers and have stood up for rights of people and stood up for voting rights and stood up for people to be able to do and have the same opportunities as growers' children. And so. I really appreciate this being before the committee uh, or the council, and I look forward to being there one day uh, where we can celebrate this and have a CSIP with the attitude and where every day uh, people on the way to school, uh, Cesar Chavez High School, Cesar Chavez Park, Cesar Chavez Community Center, and now Cesar, and hopefully Cesar Chavez Boulevard will carry that CSIP with the attitude for the people. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, I have a comment real quick. Please. You know, Mayor, I just really want to thank Alejandro. Alejandro came uh, when I was first running for office, and from there, he's been a servant leader, helping out the community. Um, I know that the month of March and April are very busy for him, that he goes and I don't know how many hundreds of schools and, and community um, organizations to speak about his data, but not just to speak about his data, to be an example 
of what a servant leader is. So Alejandro, just thank you for everything you do to keep your legacy, your Tata's legacy alive, but also for being an example for young people and and how you help to change this world and make it a better place. So thank you too. Thank you. Well said, Councilman Nowakowski. And I think it's meaningful to us as an elected body that the Chavez family supports this designation and, and the street on which it is proposed to occur. Um, and I guess any final comments about why it's important to, to recognize the legacy from Alejandro before we turn to Mark? So. All right, uh, then we will go ahead and uh, open up the microphone for Mark Rodriguez. Hello, Mayor Kate Gallego and everybody at the City Council. It's good to hear from you again. It's because I'm going to miss Michael Norikowski and Thelma Williams because I'm going to miss them both from both city councils. Even though I met Michael Norikowski back in 2018 because he was such a fine man to me because I met him at the Thanksgiving at Food City on Central and Baseline. It's because I'm going to miss him so much. I hope you bless your work and bless your family and bless everybody at the place. And I hope the Cesar Chavez Community Center will be open this fall because I can't wait to see it because, and I heard there's going to be a Cesar Chavez vote in Baseline because on 75th Avenue and Baseline and all the way to 38th Street and Baseline. It's because I'm excited. It's because I always like you guys because, especially Michael Norkowski, I'm going to miss him because it's all, I'm a fan of him since 2018 because I'm going to miss him so much because I like Norkowski so much because he represents us. And I met him in 2019 when you and Mayor Kate Gallego for the money for the Salmon Community Center at the, I mean, Santa Chavez Community Center in the Santa Chavez High School that I used to go to when I was a teenager. It's because I'm always going to miss you, Mr. Norkowski. And also, everybody at the city council. I hope is having a great time and all that. And then, and I always been been blessed with Norkowski because I'm gonna miss him. It's because I always been a fan of you, Norkowski. And I wish you asked me questions and all that. And I will miss you, man. And then I always seen you at Lindo Park too, and a bunch of other communities that I met. And I also I'm gonna miss you, Norkowski. Have a great day. Hasta la vista, baby. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for that uh, comment. Uh, thank you to both of our speakers and the Chavez family for your support. Uh, with that, I will turn to council members for comments. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Um, Amir, I just want to say kudos to Councilman Nowakowski. To the very end of his term, he looks out for the city and he makes sure that we honor the people who have been a part of our city. I think this is an outstanding idea and uh, thank you so much for doing this, Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman. Pastor, did you sure. wish to provide comments? Yes, yes. So um, I have a deep-rooted history with uh, with Cesar Chavez, actually, because and and family, but uh, more him because he. I was part of some of those uh, protests and fasts. My my family was, and it really was the farm worker movement that advanced or involved my family into politics. And so Michael, you'll appreciate this. President Mecha, there was Cesar Chavez. We were pushing the the uh I can't even remember her name. Uh, but the English only was coming. Uh, we were fighting against it. 
And Cesar Chavez was in town to rally us and get us ready for, for the fight. My uncle, Bob, who traveled during the movement and traveled to Texas and, and went on the movement and got himself in trouble and my, my grandparents uh, sending money to get him out of trouble and, and you know helping him with where, wherever he was in the movement. And he was the one who, who wanted to be the politician and who ran for office in that time, nobody really ran for office and ran for, uh, I think he was the first Hispanic JP in South Phoenix. And he, sadly, he was uh, uh, killed at a young age of 25 when he was starting his career and, uh, and no longer was with us. And I was with Cesar when we were talking about the English only move or getting rid of the English only movement. And I started to talk about my uncle. And I got emotional and I said, okay, I have to stop. And then he stood next to me and he said, mijita, it's okay. You're Latina, we're Latinos, it's okay to be emotional. And so that's, that's the memory I have with him and sharing that moment and bond, but also uh, being part of the movement and working the movement as we did. The other piece is that I never ate grapes. I was trained at a very young age not to eat grapes. I also was trained to any reception that we were at that had grapes uh, to get a napkin and put the grapes in the, in the napkin and throw the grapes away to honor the farm workers. So when the ban was lifted, I didn't eat grapes for a very long time because I'm like, I don't think we can eat grapes. They're like, Laura, the band has been lifted. So my kids have grown up with grapes. And so uh, I like the fact that we were able to make some movement and change for the farm workers and realizing that our voice counted. So I think it's uh, fitting to name, name uh, well, worth it baseline, the area of baseline to name it, uh, have our, our signs for Cesar Chavez. And just want like to thank you for bringing it forward. I'm hoping, and I think it will, some of my other council members will be bringing Dolores Huerta forward. So uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. And uh, Carlos, I, and probably Betty, born and Betty, we're all part of the movement. So it's, it's fitting for this. Councilwoman Gordado. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I also thank you so much, Con Councilman Nowakowski, for bringing this forward. Right, as everyone knows, I grew, I grew up in the union. I never had the pleasure of meeting um, Cesar Chavez, but I learned a lot um, through everything that he did, through the strikes, through the boycotts. I remember um, doing my first fast in 19... I want to say it was 19, 19, 1999 when the USC workers decided to fast. And Marilena Durazo, who is now a senator out in California, she decided to fast for 20, 25 days. And it got to a point where they had to stop her and take her to the hospital, um, you know, and just trying to continue with that legacy and continue with that work of making sure you know, that, that, that Cesar Chavez's dream and, and the dream that everyone fights for, like fighting. I remember seeing a quote from him saying, like, we're fighting for that American dream, right? People come to this country to be able to have just one job, to be able to work really hard um, and, and work with that honor and with that pride of being able to provide for their families. Um, but, I, but I do think that there's a lot of folks out there that took advantage of that. And we now have folks working two or three jobs. And I'm hopeful um, that being able to put up this this sign is is just a, a you know a little reminder that there's still a lot of work to be done, um, especially here in in the city of Phoenix. 
um, when it comes to, be, you know, our families being able to get to that middle class, which I know was Cesar Chavez's dream. Um, it was his dream to making sure um, that working class families that took pride for the work that they did, um, you know, just got a little bit of that. And, I, and to me, like, I hold that deep in my heart. Like, I was an organizer for over 20 years, and God knows I fasted, and I led a ton of picket lines. And uh, and, it, and, it's a, and it's a lot of the work that Cesar Chavez did um, for many, many years. I remember, like, I had the honor of knocking on doors um, with Dolores Huerta three years ago, and she gave me this awesome token and said, this is your good luck charm, and this is going to make you win your campaign which I did, and I'm always going to be thankful for that as well. I'm looking forward to seeing what we will do for her in the future. But today, I will, with a lot of pride and with a lot of honor, being, being able to support, um, to support this item, which is, again, a reminder that we still have a lot of work to do um, coming up. Uh, but definitely, it's going to be awesome to be able to see that reminder um, of, of his legacy. And hopefully, on the council, we'll continue to follow his legacy and we will continue to push to bringing, um, to being able to bring working class families um, back into place. So thank you so much, Council Member Nowakowski, for that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Council Member Garcia. You're muted. You're muted. Carlos. Hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I, I too support the sign. I do think it's uh it's 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 great to commemorate all the work. Um some of the elders of the folks that taught me how to organize, Gustavo Gutierrez, I sim had a similar experience with Dolores like Michael did, where, where I got to drive her around um different places. Um, and see really the work that those folks put in. Um, one of the, the folks I work with here in Phoenix, once there was a question, the folks were asking who their favorite artist was, and he answered Cesar Chavez. And everybody kind of looked at him and, you know, what do, you, what do you mean? And he actually considered him an artist. The way he was able to stand up to power, the way that he was able to, from a, a little, you know, those 40 acres in Delano, that you know in early 2000s i got the opportunity to organize there as well um he was able to get the entire country and even the world to boycott grapes for the rights of those workers and i think that dedication that selflessness is with all the contradictions that exist you know there's some articles that are the you know um speaking some truths of, of you know of what happened in the contradictions whether gender inequalities or or immigration issues all those sorts of things that were in the movement there's still inspiration for generations. As, as we speak here today, um, we all have personal stories about how, you know, learning about Cesar Chavez or engaging with the work of, of the UFW has changed our lives. Um, but I do unequivocally would say that Cesar would trade these signs for a hospitality ordinance, for a payment wage, for us being able to be responsive um, to the folks that are hurting the most during this pandemic, um, for supporting those that were that are most hurting now, seeing the videos of how Cesar and the UFW stood towards against police violence in those fields when their strikes are being broken, um, you know we saw a picture of Loretta Scott King with Cesar Chavez, the Black Brown Unity and the work that was being done back then. Again, unequivocally, I think Cesar Chavez would be in the streets because of what happened this week with right or what happened with george floyd last year and so i'm really proud for this this signage to go up um but i also am committed with that prayer that was read earlier by, by council member nowakowski to continue to doing the work that was started um by those folks and and continue to unequivocally um defend protect and work side along the workers of Phoenix. So thank you all so much and I'm for sure be supporting this signage. Thank you, Council Member Garcia. Any final comments before we go to roll call? Roll call. Cecilio. Yes. 
Garcia. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Nowakowski. Mayor, just a small comment is uh, I just really want to thank all the men and women that work for the um, Cesar Chavez Foundation. If it's in our educational department or in our housing department or working with the senior um, center, senior um, centers or even with our immigration programs, just thank you for all those hours. I know that a lot of you don't get paid and you're volunteers and that's what it's all about is having that CISA put attitude and, and helping change this world. So I'm a yes. Pastor. CISA puede. Si. Stark. Yes. Waring. I apologize. Waring. Yes. Did you hear thank, me? Yes. Thank yes. you. Williams. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Woohoo! A unanimous vote. Congratulations. Thank you to Councilman Nowakowski for bringing this forward. We next turn to our a final agenda item of today, which is an update from the America Associations of Government on homelessness and regional issues. Uh, we have worked and moved forward on several different fronts at the city of Phoenix, but we know this problem extends beyond our city boundaries and are glad to have this regional update. Maricopa Associations of Government, often known as MAG, has been working on this and putting in additional resources. Um, and we look forward to getting their update. I'd also like to thank my fellow council members who have spent years and sometimes decades on this issue uh, without their continued focus we would not be able to help as many individuals as we do today. Councilwoman Pastor, specifically, thank you for asking this item to be for this item to be on the agenda. Uh, I will now turn it over to our city manager, Ed Zerker, to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So as the mayor noted today, we have a presentation on the efforts to create a regional plan to address homelessness issue here in uh, the region, in Phoenix and the region. So just a quick reminder, first of all, the Maricopa Associations of Governments, Association of Governments is called MAG, and we're gonna hear a lot of the word MAG today, but that's what it stands for. MAG provides a forum for local governments to work together on issues that affect the lives of everyone in the greater Phoenix region. They're a regional agency that conducts planning and makes policy decisions in a number of core areas, including travel, the economy and growth, environment and sustainability, and improving quality of life, which would wrap into this issue of people experiencing homelessness. Members of MAG include 27 cities and towns, which includes Phoenix. There also are three native uh, tribes or nations, Maricopa County itself, portions of Pinal County, and the Arizona Department of Transportation. So last fall, as Phoenix worked on its own homelessness plan, and the council was debating the issue of zoning changes related to the Human Services Campus, your dialogue was to push for more regional solutions that did not include other cities sending people in need of services to downtown Phoenix. So with that direction, I asked at MAG Executive Director Eric Anderson to begin taking on the task or to resume taking on the task of developing a regional dialogue and a regional plan that would bring together the member towns and cities in a targeted and effective way. Mr. Anderson agreed and immediately assigned his number two right-hand person, Amy St. Peter, the Deputy Executive Director of MAG, who Amy has a proven track record of regional uh, forums, conducting regional solution uh, seeking groups, and in the area of homelessness is recognized as a leader. So it's my uh, privilege today to introduce Amy St. Peter, Deputy Executive Director of the Maricopa Association of Governments, who will uh, take you through an update on the progress of what has gone on in the MAG region for the last four months. Uh, a, a lot of good work is going on, and um, so at this at this time, I'll turn it over to Amy, and then we'll seek your feedback and questions and input into the regional plan process. Amy. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you very much, Mayor and Council, for having me here today. We're very excited to be able to share this update with you and are very thankful for your continued partnership. We've been working extremely closely with, with you, with your staff, and that partnership has been critical to these efforts, being relevant to the regional impact that we can have by working together. So we're excited to share this with you and particularly to share with you a highlight of some of the results from the outreach and the research that's been conducted to support this work as we move to action with your support moving forward. These are the main topics that I'll be covering today, really focusing on the partnerships, the framework, the process, and timeline that have been used to undertake this work. I had mentioned uh, previously the outreach and data analysis. I will be offering um, those regional steps that have been drafted for your approval next month, and, and I will be talking about some next steps that we can take collectively as we seek to reduce the numbers of people who are experiencing homelessness, and in particular, to expand the geographic footprint of homeless assistance programs beyond the city of Phoenix and to honor the investment, the significant investment that you've already made to date. One of the most critical partnerships that we have in this work is indeed with the City of Phoenix. This partnership extends through a number of different areas, but primarily in terms of our ongoing partnership, it's primarily through committee membership as well as project-specific activities. These activities are extremely important to ensuring that the regional plans are relevant to the local priorities and that these meet your needs. So we're thankful to the, to the investment of time, to the feedback, and to the partnership that we share with your staff. And in particular, I'd like to thank Marcelle Franklin. She's been a trusted advisor through all of, these, um, through all, through all of this work, and we couldn't do this without her and without the City of Phoenix as a true partner in this process. When we started to enhance our regional efforts to, to respond to homelessness, we, we began immediately partnering extremely closely with the City of Phoenix, building on that, that history of the relationship that we've had for a number of years. This coordination around the regional strategies has extended over a number of different ways, but including outreach, data analysis, as well as project direction. We're also working with a number of other talented partners in this space, of course, AmeriCopa Regional Continuum of Care. Marshall Franklin serves on that board, and DC Earns from Phoenix Fire serves on the Continuum of Care Committee. We're thankful for their investment of time. We're also working with all of our member agencies, the cities, towns, counties, and native nations to ensure that this work is relevant to all communities and is responsive to all priorities throughout the region. We're working very closely with a new group called the Regional Collaborative on Homelessness. This is a partnership among six different regional entities. In addition to MAG, this partnership includes Maricopa County, ASU Action Nexus on Homelessness, the Arizona Housing Coalition, the United Way, and Vilas Health Foundation. Together, we're maximizing each other's efforts and amplifying our collective impact. We're also working with a number of talented subject matter experts in diverse sectors, um, primarily as we seek to host these outreach forums and also as we're developing the detailed tactics that will accompany the strategies as they move forward. Moving forward then, this is a framework that we've undertaken in order to engage in this work. We're very focused on developing those strategies then in the areas of housing, shelter, services, coordination, diversion, and prevention. The main goals from all of this work are threefold. One, to reduce the numbers of people who are experiencing homelessness. Two, to increase access to homeless assistance programs throughout the entire region. And then three, to strengthen the safety net for all people, again, throughout the entire region. An example of a possible strategy that we're looking into very deeply and working towards um, very, um, very assertively is to create a regional system of local shelters. This will help to expand the geographic footprint of those homeless assistance programs and help people to stabilize more quickly because they're closer to their job to their children's schools, to family, friends, and faith communities. The vision and mission for this work have been developed um, in large part through a municipal staff forum that was held just last month. City Phoenix staff are instrumental in helping to shape that event, as well as in helping to shape this vision and mission statement. As you can see, this vision statement is that all communities in the region will be strong, safe, and healthy communities. And the mission statement, again, is reducing and preventing the rate of homelessness um, by collaborating across all sectors, making homelessness rare, brief, and one time. A number of different guiding principles have been developed on the basis of this work, the outreach as well as the research. And again, having a keen focus that this work be truly regional. Homelessness is inherently regional and efforts to address homelessness must be regional and holistic as well. We are very focused on providing a range of different housing solutions that can be present throughout the entire region 
starting with emergency shelter, bridge housing, all of these different options. We want every community to consider how they can increase the housing options that are available to their residents, both housed and unsheltered in their communities. Moving forward then, all of this work will be data driven. We, are, we have been conducting extensive research in order to inform these efforts. We do also have a keen focus on racial equity. All of this work, um, through all of this work, we are committed to anti-racism in all structures, systems, and policies. This is leveraging the extensive work of the continuum of care. The City of Phoenix has been an integral partner in moving this important work forward. Related to our focus on racial equity is our, is our commitment that these activities will be inclusive. We need to have a commitment to anti-oppression and we need to engage all people in this important work. We'll also be proactive to make sure that we are attempting to divert people away from the homeless system in the first place. It's more cost effective, it's more humane if we can keep people housed so they don't have to experience homelessness. Moving forward now, there are just a few more. This, this work will be, cons will be comprehensive. We're very focused on offering that full range of assistance, particularly um, centering on substance use and mental health treatment. These are important considerations for people experiencing homelessness, and we need to make sure that people have the help that they need when they need it the most. We will also be accountable. We will hold ourselves accountable by monitoring progress made and by making mid-course adjustments as needed throughout the process, and this work will be sustainable. We are very keenly focused on making sure that, the, that all of this work is financially sustainable for the long term so that we can achieve this progress and maintain progress then moving into the future. And finally, this work will be collaborative among diverse sectors with an emphasis on persons with lived experience, and we are seeking to also work across systems and to make sure that we can achieve change by working in, in coordination with them. A few examples of the systems that we're speaking of are the criminal justice system, healthcare, and education, just to name a few. Moving forward then, this is the process that we've used in order to develop these strategies. We wanted to ground this work in, in your local priorities, in your plans. Particularly, we delve deeply into the City of Phoenix plans to make sure that our work is in alignment with your work. We then canvass the country to make sure that we were leveraging the most effective regional practices that we could find nationally. And then we use those to develop 40 initial strategies. We are using five different regional goals, which I'll touch on in just a moment, to identify the most viable action steps that we can take as a region. All of this is driving towards the development of a regional portfolio, which will be presented ultimately to the MAG Regional Council for approval just next month. These are the regional goals then that I spoke of. Um, you'll see placeholders as we conduct further analysis. The first is to substantially increase flexible funding for homeless assistance and diversion programs. We are identifying the amount that we'll need in order to move the region forward on this. The goals continue then with geographically dispersing homeless shelters and other housing options throughout the entire region. These regional goals were vetted with the Maricopa Regional Continuum of Care, the MAG Management Committee, and MAG Regional Council just last month. All of the five goals that I'll share with you were developed from diverse perspectives, including people with lived experience, a racial equity lens, and high quality data. Continuing on then, these are the, re the remaining three goals that we're working extensively on right now and using this to filter the strategies to make sure that we're moving forward with the best opportunities for action that the region has. All of this work has been conducted on an aggressive timeline and that's because people need solutions now and communities need action now. When we first ramped up our regional efforts last fall at the, at, the, at the request of the City of Phoenix, that work initially focused on research and outreach aggressively, and right now we're in the process of developing and fine-tuning those regional strategies and then driving towards the tactics to implement those strategies. This is a bit more detail then about um, the timeline for this work, again, beginning last fall, continuing with um, in January of, of this year in terms of that extensive outreach that engaged more than 700 people through 10 different forums. We are continuing then on this timeline, and these, um, which includes the guiding principles and the vision statement that you just saw, as well as those regional goals. Currently, we are um, starting to develop the tactics by working with subject matter experts to develop each of those. In early June, we'll offer a capstone event in which we will invite back all of the forum participants to be able to come together to break down silos and to build bridges that we need to implement these strategies successfully. That implementation plan will be offered for approval in August, and then in fall, the continuum of care will launch their regional plan effort, which will be very focused on the subpopulations within all of the homeless population throughout the region. Throughout all of this, 
outreach, we've been, we have sought to engage a diverse array of different partners. We've contacted and reached more than 700 people so far through a variety of different forums at the request of the City of Phoenix. We did start um, those forums with the, with the nonprofit community to make sure that we were embedding this work in their deep expertise. We have um, reached out to a number of different diverse sectors to make sure that, that every sector has an opportunity in this work. Homelessness is not caused by any one sector, nor can it be solved by any one sector. And so that, ne that necessitates a diverse outreach like this. The Municipal Staff Forum was held just last month. City of Phoenix, again, did attend and did participate significantly to that. And we want to thank your mayor for speaking at the elected official forum tomorrow. There is time to register. We do hope that you'll join us. And that forum will be held at 11 a.m. tomorrow virtually. And we're excited to be able to share this work and, again, planning for that capstone event in June. This is some of the dialogue that we've, that we've undertaken throughout all of these forums. We've been talking with folks across diverse sectors, what is working right now, what is not, and what can we do best together as a region? And this is, um, and then moving forward as well, we've also been conducting surveys with a whole range of different stakeholders. Particularly one that we have out in the field right now is a field survey with people with lived experience. We want to thank the City of Phoenix for helping to send this survey out to people in the field who are experiencing homelessness right now. We also want to thank the City of Phoenix, Fire, and PD for helping distribute the law enforcement and first responder surveys. We are using that information to help us to refine the strategies, particularly in these areas. We have surveyed all of our our, all of our foreign participants, as well as um, it, in regard to their satisfaction with the events, as well as to gain more insights into their top three priority strategies. The uses for this survey data then, are, we're using all of this data from the surveys as well as from the outreach to help us identify and refine those regional strategies, build support for, for ongoing activities moving forward, and particularly being able to move forward on some strategies earlier, such as with a persons with lived experience advisory council. We are identifying people who just completed the survey um, and we are able to work with them on that council, which will be formed soon. We have a whole range of different tools that we're using right now to maintain ongoing communication that significantly includes the City of Phoenix, who has been a trusted advisor throughout all of this work. We're using all of these different tools to ensure that we can leverage your deep expertise and to gain, from, gain knowledge from your perspective of diverse stakeholders. And all of this work, this is what we're hearing so far. The top priorities, absolutely preventing and reducing homelessness, being, being um, sure to address a system the inequities inherent in, the, in, in our systems at times, to strengthen coordina coordination and partnerships, and to invest in more housing-focused solutions. We've conducted a tremendous amount of data to help us really deeply understand these issues and to make sure that we're moving forward with the best possible strategies, understanding that homelessness is on the rise. Now, for the first time ever, we have more people living on the streets than we do in shelters, and we understand that some races are disproportionately affected, such as African Americans and Native Americans, and we are committed to correcting that and to ensuring that all people have equitable access to the solutions, the best solutions our region can provide. Since the fall, we have conducted five different studies focused on understanding the best practices here locally as well as nationally, understanding the funding that might be brought to bear to support this work moving forward, better understanding the considerations that need to be taken into account as we expand that geographic footprint of homeless assistance programs, and making sure that um, the funding is there then to support all communities in this work. In terms of the regional strategies, there are 14 different strategies in the five different categories that you see in front of you right now. I'll cover each of these categories in turn. In terms of diversion and prevention, it's not always included in homelessness initiatives, although we found that it's particularly critical considering how many people we have right now living at risk of experiencing homelessness in our region. Housing is absolutely essential focus. We are working right now with the Municipal Human Services Director to use projection tools to identify the number of shelter beds and housing units needed at that regional level and to making sure that we have a range of options in order to be able to put these solutions in place. Coordination is key. A number of our strategies are focused on coordinating around, uh, around enhancing racial equity and to making sure that all people have equitable access to these solutions. And we are working across sectors to make sure that we are engaging in a very holistic and comprehensive approach. Services are a critical component to housing. It's critical in, in particular to enhance a coordinated entry system. We need simply more access points throughout the entire region and we need absolutely to refine the screening tools that we're using right now. 
Temporary housing and shelter is a critical need. We need to be able to move people off the streets into housing as quickly as possible, more quickly really than we can do right now. So we're working with subject matter experts and a whole range of different stakeholders in order to make this happen. We're working very closely with the Crisis Response Network and Corporation for Supportive Housing to be able to move together in this space. And moving forward then, um, going into the final stages of this presentation, we want to make sure that all of the data that we have developed is available to you 24-7. And so we've created this map. This map shows you the locations of homeless assistance programs throughout the entire region. You will notice that many of them are clustered within the city of Phoenix. It's our commitment to ensure that this geographic footprint expands beyond the city of Phoenix and, and, and is indeed more robustly present throughout the entire region. Future iterations of this map will include population concentrations of people who are experiencing homeless, homelessness right now, as well as those who might be at risk. This is an example of what it looks like when you click on an icon. We're, we're utilizing the data from 211 as well as a housing inventory chart created by the Continuum of Care to populate this map. These are the next steps that we're undertaking right now. We encourage your full participation in this work as it moves forward. We want to thank you for your partnership and for all the ways that we've been able to work together and to learn from you as we undertake these critical questions. I am happy to answer any questions that you might have for me, but if you would consider perhaps a few questions um, um, so that I might benefit from your insight, from your expertise as well. Some questions perhaps for you to consider would include, what are the most important actions that we can take as a region? What do you need for the City of Phoenix to be fully involved with these regional efforts? And then how can we build support, capacity, and accountability for this work throughout the region? That does conclude my formal presentation. I'd be happy now to take any questions that you might have, as well as to hear any answers that you might like to offer. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much for your presentation. Council members, any comments or questions? Mayor? It's Councilwoman Guardado. Wonderful, Councilwoman Guardado, please. Thank you. Um, well, first off, I just wanna say thank you, Amy, for your hard work on all of this. As you know, part of our goal at the city is to build a regional approach to addressing homelessness. I appreciate you touring our Project Haven with some of our West, West Side leaders. I am working with Lisa Glow on forming the Homelessness Solutions Alliance to help align regional leaders with the work you are doing. And we've been working together also with, with Westmark to try to figure out how do we how do we get the rest of the cities involved? How do we have more of a regional approach? I think people are curious to see what the Haven project is, and they've heard a lot of great things about it. So I know that everyone is looking forward to being able to continue to do some of these tours and definitely looking forward to working um, with you and collaborating with you and everyone on, on your team. And we're here to support the work that you, that you are doing. Um, it's not an easy task. I know that it's something that it's gonna take um, us as a, I would say as a city, as a state, as Maricopa County, um, to be able to find solutions. I know there's different cities um, like Glendale that are that are starting to look at different approaches. So um, I'm excited about that. Um, but whatever it is that you need, um, let us know and, and we're here to help. Thank you. Thank you very much, council member. We truly appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thank you for your leadership on multiple regional fronts. I think I saw, did I see Councilmember Garcia? Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was a lot of information. I was, I was trying to keep up, but it, it, was, it was hard. Um, I have some couple of specific questions of things you mentioned and then things we've been trying to figure out ourselves. Um, we, you know, I heard uh, Housing First, uh, be in the in the conversation. I think for us, housing first and low barrier access continue to be the two most uh, important things, and and the, the things we've at least heard are are what's most needed. Um, the question I had is, and and I, how do I say this without? <laughs> so, for a while now, it seemed like, you know, the yearning of a regional approach. And you know, trying to figure that out has kind of kept us from from moving on things. Um, and also, this idea has prevailed that 
smaller shelters are better. I, our office and myself have had a hard time finding data or information that, um, that proves that. And so I guess knowing that housing first and, and giving low barrier access are, are two of the priorities in the work you've done and the conversations you've had, um, do you feel like this priority this priority or focus on smaller specialized shelters is the best thing or you know from what we're seeing across the country is the housing first low barrier the things we should focus on first excellent thank you very much council member for that question and we need a range of solutions. I don't know that any one model is necessarily exclusively better than another, but here are some considerations to keep in mind. One, when there are smaller shelters that are fully integrated into the community, it can help to um, better integrate the residents of that shelter into the, into the social fabric of that community. And it can also, um, so, so, that, so that can work to the benefit of, of the individual. Every, every individual, every family has what they consider to be a home community, whether they're housed or unsheltered, unhoused, experiencing homelessness. And it's faster for them, they can more effectively stabilize when they're close to their job, to their children's school, to healthcare, family, friends, faith communities. That happens when they can remain in their home community, even when they lose their home. And so that would support the idea of having small shelters located in all communities, located throughout the region, because people then would be able to receive assistance more quickly and within, within a neighborhood that they know and love and have called home for, for a number of years. So that can benefit the individuals who are experiencing homelessness. It also benefits the individual communities, because communities um, have a broad range of responsibilities. Among them is to be a good fiscal steward of the funds that have been entrusted to them. So when they can use their funding to help their residents, that, um, that has a number of benefits as well. And so I would not necessarily advocate against larger centralized shelters. I think there's absolutely a role for them and they can achieve economies of scale that would be difficult to achieve at the smaller shelters. However, I do think that we need a range of solutions throughout the region, understanding that each one will have its own set of benefits as well as challenges. And we need to be mindful of what those are and to plan accordingly. Thank you. I, yeah, I think that's, you know, you're getting right to my question where I think it's figuring out if we're actually, and again, this is for us to figure out, and I know we have to think about everyone, but it's kind of catering to the folks that may feel safer, or you know you know that that they you know the the community folks that may feel safer or may feel better that folks are in smaller shelters versus are we trying to do what's best to make sure that we're serving those folks without shelter and so thank you i mean i think it's it's a conversation that continues but i i, I hope we have we can prioritize you know better serving folks and making sure you know the folks that are in the streets are, are being supportive you also did mention <clears throat> some of the work around race and equity. Um, wondering if you could go more into, you know, we've identified it as a gap as well. We're obviously trying to figure out what that looks like, but it's been harder to outline and find specific ways or policies that impact or, you know, that we can improve the racial inequalities. Um, mm -hmm. You have a little bit more to say to that or, mm -hmm. or, or to that conversation? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Council Member. <clears throat> that is a keen area of focus for us. The Maricopa Regional Continuum of Care has been um, very in taking a lot of intention and a lot of thought to this work. We've held a number of trainings, a number of forums, and we've been working with racial equity partners who are the consultants who are helping to guide us in this work. This has been led by Julie Montoya on our MAG staff, as well as by um, Samantha Jackson with Downtown Phoenix Partnership and with Nikki Stevens with the City of Tempe. And so we thank them for their leadership in this space. We have developed a racial equity plan which has four different components. One of them is a coordinated entry system and making sure that particularly with the screening tools, we're finding from our research, from our local experience that the screening tools may not, they're very well intentioned, um, but they may have some unintended side effects of not providing equitable access to all people of all races and all ethnicities and, and different 
different personal attributes that may set them at a disadvantage in that screening process. And so we need to look very intentionally at those screening tools that are being used and at that coordinated entry process, and we need to make sure that it is not burdening some people more than others and that it is truly equitable in all aspects. The other three components of that racial equity plan are to include people with lived experience of, of homelessness, particularly people of color, in decision-making roles throughout the homeless system of, uh, of care. So there's um, a motto, nothing about me without me, and so we need to make sure that we're including the people that we serve, not just as stakeholders, but in that decision-making process. And so that's why we're wanting to move forward very quickly with the persons with lived experience, um, uh, persons with lived experience homeless advisory council. Um, which will absolutely include people of color and have that very strong racial equity focus to make sure that we're learning from their unique perspective of actually experiencing homelessness and they can help to lead us in the best actions that we can take as a region. One of the other areas is um, continuing to examine data and to understand the racial disparities that exist and to making sure that we're, we're proactively and actively taking uh, measures to, to address those those barriers and, and those disparities. And also making sure that the workforce and the organizations that we're working with are all committed to anti-racism. There's so much commitment to this right now and we are blessed with a very diverse workforce. And so we want to make sure that we support the full range of our workforce and to make sure that, um, that everyone has an opportunity to serve to their highest and best potential in this work. So those are the four elements right now of the racial equity plan and we are very committed to this work moving forward. Thank you. <clears throat> kind of related to that, I think one of the, the things when we passed our homelessness plan last year was that uh, we were going to try not to criminalize folks. And so question is, you know, how do you think or how has the conversation about criminalizing versus not happened or, or where are your thoughts around it? Um, you know, our, that our judge over at the city court has done the homelessness court. We, we try to do some things to support folks. Um, and so, you know, how have you thought about this conversation? And also, if you could expand a little bit more on the misdemeanor center. I know you scanned by it, um, but I wasn't sure what it really meant. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Councilmember Mary and members of the council. Be happy to talk with you about that. We did conduct um, two surveys, one with law enforcement and the other with first responders. We garnered more than 500 responses from throughout the region, um, in large part thanks to the city of Phoenix for helping to, to promote that survey so, so fully. In that um, survey, we're able to glean some very good information about how both um, first responders and law enforcement perceive their roles. And their there are a number of different roles that, that both sectors can and do play. Um, neither sector, though, has their primary function as addressing homelessness. They have different primary functions, of course. But often, they're in the first position um, to come into contact with people who are experiencing homelessness. And that puts them in a, in a unique position, then, to be able to offer assistance. And so from those survey results, we looked at it, and the primary, or the the, the top ranked role that law enforcement found, according to these survey results, is to connect people with services. And, and then that helps us to better understand how they perceive their role and also puts us in a better position then to support them in that role. First responders saw their, their highest function in addressing homelessness as meeting the emergency needs of people who are experiencing homelessness. So their top three roles were all the same, but they ranked them differently. And so law enforcement really was connecting them to services. And there are a variety of different ways that that can happen, and it doesn't have to conflict with their role in terms of, um, in terms of their primary role as law enforcement, which is enforcement, right? Um, with the misdemeanor regional or with the misdemeanor repeat offender program, we've seen great success in that in a number of cities throughout the region. We see some opportunities to regionalize that work. And that consistency is really important, um, particularly from a regional approach, but that has a local impact as well. So if law enforcement in one community is doing something dramatically different than their neighboring law enforcement department and their neighboring community, then that can simply move people who are experiencing homelessness from one community to another and not actually addressing what's causing that homelessness. And so we want to engage people as quickly as possible, as effectively as possible. And the misdemeanor 
repeat offender program is one way that we can do that. And so by requiring that people access services as a diversion, you know, from, um, from going into um, you know, jail, prison, um, as, as a diversion away from the criminal justice system, that can alleviate the burden on the criminal justice system. It also increases the effectiveness of that human services system, of that social services system. And so we've been engaged with a number of stakeholders from throughout the region. There is a lot of interest in this, and we see some very good economies of scale and consistency that can come about um, by regionalizing those local best practices. Thank you. And I just have a couple more, Mayor, sorry. Um, I think one of the things We've been having a conversation, and and, a, and the the word service resistant I've been hearing, and um, don't feel like I don't I don't appreciate the word. I think it's it's kind of putting the onus back on folks, and similar to how we criminalize people, it's kind of maybe we haven't figured out how to how to give services to all folks. Um, but speaking to folks that may have already gone through services or may not have found the services that's right to them, I think. A conversation that's missing in this, just the reality that some folks are gonna need to have access or are gonna be in public spaces, and so I feel like we're we're hesitant to have that conversation. But is there a conversation of what our needs, or at what point do we just recognize that hey, public spaces are and legally they should be available to folks? So what does public restrooms or other shade structures, those sorts of things? Um, look like for folks that just kind of we need to acknowledge that some folks are just going to be in the public. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Council Member, Mayor and members of the Council. That's a great point in talking about um, people being labeled as being service resistant. At times we'll label people as being hard to serve, but we don't always ask ourselves if programs are hard to access. And what choices do people have in accessing those programs? So for example, pets. Pets are very near and dear to, to many of our hearts. Um, and particularly when people have been experiencing homelessness, they may have been cut off from every other friend and family that they've known except for their pet. And so if they can't bring their pet with them into shelter, most shelters understandably don't allow that, then they're being labeled hard to serve, but it's really that they don't want to be separated from the one living thing in this world that's never abandoned them, you know? Um, things like having to give up their belongings, um, having to be clean and sober. People can stabilize more quickly in housing. Um, it's a lot harder to overcome substance use when you're living on the streets. And so when we have barriers that prevent people from entering programs, that really prolongs the time that they're living on the streets and living without access to some of those services. So I think it's really critical to create spaces for people create different kinds of programs for people that really meets them where they are and to be able to provide that range of different options and opportunities. All of us in our own lives have, un have any number of different choices and we're all people and people need choices and so people experiencing homelessness need choices as well. Communities need choices and so at the community level, at the individual level, we need to make sure that we're offering safe and humane choices so that people can overcome whatever barriers they're facing and they can achieve their highest potential, their highest level of functioning. And so that level of support is very critical. It's also very individualized. And so we're very keenly focused on providing a whole range of choices for individuals, for communities, so that we can all thrive by working um, better together. Thank you. And this is the last question, I promise. Um, we've been having, obviously, a lot of us, we're, we know summers are getting hotter and we're having the conversation about heat relief. We had some heat relief last year. We're hopefully this year gonna include an office in our programming uh, that deals directly with climate and heat. Um, what are some recommendations, some conversations about those, of, about that work and how it's happening or how we can do it better as a region? And then final, final, final question. Um, how has it been surveying the folks that are um, living in the streets or without shelter? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Council Member, Mayor, and members of the Council. Um, in regard to your first question about the heat relief network, every day that it gets hotter, I get more and more concerned about the people um, who are experiencing homelessness. It's, it's never a good time of year to experience homelessness, but particularly over the summer months, it can and often is deadly. We have seen as a result of the pandemic, many sites, understandably, needing to 
to close their doors, particularly last summer. The number of people who died last, last year uh, during the summer months as a result of the heat doubled. So we see a very direct correlation between the regional heat relief network and the number of partners that it has and the amount of support that we're able to offer and the number of people who are losing their lives then to the extreme summer heat. So we need more partners, we need more sites. There are very, very good protocols that can be put into place to make it safe to open your doors, even over, even over the summer months, even as we're still recovering from the pandemic. And so I would encourage everyone to please um, contact us about the Regional Heat Relief Network. State of Phoenix is a huge partner in that regard. They do a tremendous amount of good through, through all of their efforts. We need more partners. The number of partners that we have as we're starting to mobilize for the summer, it's still down from what it used to be. And we're very concerned we don't want to repeat last summer where the number of people died. Um, we need more partners in this space. We thank the City of Phoenix for partnering so well and for really presenting a model for the rest of the region to follow. In terms of your second question about the Persons with Lived Experience survey, that has been extremely gratifying. The City of Phoenix has been an incredible partner in that regard. We are partnering very closely with other communities as well as with nonprofit agencies, and it's overwhelming. We've heard from over 160 people so far, and so many of them have said, yes, I want to be a part of this work going forward. I want to be part of, the, of these regional solutions. So we're very excited to be able to form this Persons with Lived Experience Advisory Council. We're working closely with our consultants home base to make that happen, and we hope to continue and deepen our partnership, particularly with the City of Phoenix in that regard. And thank you for the questions, that's why I'm here. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Pestor. Yes, um, I really appreciate uh, this presentation. It's long overdue in my eyes uh, since I sat on a committee, I wanna say my son was born in 2003. So I sat on that committee in 2003 speaking about this item as we're speaking about today. And I know that we've made small strides and have tried to put this together, but I also know that City of Phoenix has always been in the forefront of it. So I could probably say for all the council that is present today that we are committed uh, and we have demonstrated that we are committed to solving this issue. We do need a regional plan. And uh, it is obvious that we cannot carry the load. Uh, so I appreciate now the, the, that it's really moving and uh, putting meat. I, what I would like to see is meat to the plan on the how, where the money's coming from, who is going to do this, um, and really get to that level of, uh, of necessity because the problem is just getting bigger and it's only going to get bigger and we just need to now start doing the how um, and that's kind of where i'm at i do want to mention uh regarding how you mentioned the community needs choices or uh people individuals need choices and you're correct and one of the items that you spoke about were the pets because that's one of the things that we kept asking, what is what is the barriers or what are the obstacles? And one of them um, has been uh, not wanting to leave their pets or not know or or unaware of where their pets are going. So I'm glad, happy to say that we will be the city of Phoenix has uh, designed a program. And we will be opening up that program May 1st for those that are experiencing homelessness or even substance abuse, uh, but wanting, into, wanting to get services, but not wanting to leave their pets. We now have a, an area or space for them to have a choice to do that. In that design of the program, it has also been designed so that they could, uh, with transportation, with CBI, uh, be able to visit their pets and also get uh, 
rehabilitation or counseling um, with their pets along with them. So I think as a city and as a council, we've been very creative on, on moving obstacles. Uh, but I just really now think the region needs to come into play. And it's critical. Um, I'm more than willing to solve the problem as long as the region is willing to give us the dollars. Um, we can solve it. Uh, the other piece is that when we talk about having a regional plan, um, we're still talking about doing more, uh, more programs within the city of Phoenix. And my question to that, and it's just, it's just in general because we're trying to solve uh, an issue, is when we start looking at other programs other than downtown or where Cass is, let's really look at programs on the border of the cities. So um, those are my comments. I really appreciate all the work. There's many people playing in this. And so uh, I think it's needed. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. Oh, Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. It was very informative. I'm just curious, uh, as you probably know, the city of Phoenix, through their CARES dollars, set aside uh, a, a sum of money, a fairly significant sum of money, to help um, the issue of people experiencing homelessness. Did other cities and towns in our county do that? I'm sure they got CARES money as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much, Council Member, Mayor, Mayor, and members of the Council. Actually, tomorrow at the MAG Management Committee, we'll be sharing the results of our municipal expenditure study. This includes as well a, an analysis of the COVID relief funding that has come into the region. And so we've been able to track that community by community in partnership with the Arizona Housing Coalition. And we have been able to identify the portion of funding that has been allocated to homelessness as well as housing. And so we'll, we will be sharing the results of that study tomorrow. And um, in terms of the municipal, municipal expenditure study, Sapna Gupta from our staff has worked very hard on that with Applied Economics as a consultant support for that. And in that, we've been able to look at all sources of funding that have been dedicated to addressing homelessness, whether that is COVID relief funding, ongoing federal funding, or general funds. And so we've been able to determine the amount that the region is dedicating right now. We have not yet heard from all communities. We've heard from 17. And so we are, we are still completing that regional portrait. Um, part of the important the importance of that work is that then we're able to determine not just what has come into the region, but how, what choices, again, are we making as a community in terms of the percentage, the, the, the dollar amount then that's allocated to addressing homelessness, because there are choices in those funding sources, certainly. And so we're looking at the total amount, the amount by community, how that money is being allocated, such as case management, housing, shelter, services, I, um, different kinds of activities like that, but really using that as an outlet for action. So to identify how much more do we need to pull together as a region to be able to really move the needle on this. Every community needs more, and we need to do more in a coordinated fashion as a region. And so being able to look at the funding really helps us to look at that kind of as a value statement to say this is what we value as a community and as a region. And ending homelessness is absolutely a key value that we all share. And if I could just thank add, you. Thank, thank you, Councilman. Oh. If I could just add to that, I think one of the challenges we're going to get to that it's gonna to have to be addressed with a regional plan is you create the plan and people sign off onto it and then the implementation comes and what are the accountability mechanisms across the region for people right. to actually do what the plan says, right? So if we all say, yes, we need to disperse um, shelters and services so that they're not focused in one particular a part of the region or a couple, but then when the, when the time comes for a community who doesn't have the services or the shelters currently, when the time comes for them to put money and rezoning and face their own neighbors with those questions in their community, what happens if they say, nah, we're not gonna do it. It's good, just let it go back to downtown Phoenix or downtown Mesa or downtown Tempe. That, that's, where the, that's where the hard work is gonna come amongst the MAG member cities to hold each other accountable for doing the hard work of implementing a regional plan in their own boundaries when it's not politically easy. 
And so that's, that's ultimately where we're going to get to our questions like that, and, and I, there's no easy answers to it. I don't know that any region has really figured it out yet, but um, that, that's something that we're facing. I know uh, Amy's been thinking about that a lot too, and, and as well as our council members. So uh, I'm sorry for interrupting council members to start, go back to you. No, 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 I, I appreciate what you said. Um, uh, we've been working in um, the Sunny Slope area, and it's actually grown to more the northwest part of the city. And so districts one and uh, five have been involved looking at facilities. One of, one of the things that we found out, um, uh, Ash us did a, a survey of people that were going to the St. Vincent de Paul. And what I found very fascinating is a couple uh, gentlemen that she spoke to said, you know, we're not really homeless. We're experiencing a life without a house, but Sunny Slope is our home. And so I do think that we do need to look at it regionally. It can't just be downtown Phoenix or downtown Mesa or Tempe, mm -hmm. because I, I mean, to me, those comments really stood out that these people that are experiencing homelessness in Sunny Slope, Sunny Slope's their home. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's just that they don't have a house. And so we need to help. Um, in any way we can. And I think I agree with Councilwoman Pastor, the region really needs to stand, stand up and help. And then my last question is, have you approached the state and how they might also help um, the county uh, or the cities and towns within the county? I, I know last summer we opened up our uh, convention center to help people seeking heat relief and I'm looking at it in my office and I see the Coliseum. And so I think there's ways perhaps that we need to approach the state and say, you need to be a partner in this as well. And I don't know if you've really done that yet, but, um, um, you know, I think we're, I think that's important to do. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Council Member uh, Merritt and members of the Council. The state is an important partner in this work. We're working with a number of different statewide entities, such as the Arizona Housing Coalition, as well as other state departments to explore opportunities and to work together. And I think there will be additional opportunities, particularly as we develop those tactics that will really lay out um, who's doing what by where, uh, by, by, by when and where. And the where piece of this is very critical, particularly as we're looking at ex geographically dispersing homeless assistance programs throughout the region so all people can receive assistance in their home community, even if they don't have a home. You know, and just one note about the accountability. I agree that's a, absolutely a critical factor to this. What we've been hearing from communities so far has been very encouraging. So for example, some, some communities have said they feel urgently like they need to take action, but they want to make sure that they're coordinating their local actions with the regional action because they don't want to be left behind and they don't want to be hanging out front all by themselves. It, it gives them support in, or, um, if they're working together with the region. And so I think that is a statement to the commitment that people have to this work and as we forward the regional portfolio for approval in May. That will go before the MAG Management Committee, which is all of the city, town, county managers throughout the region, and um, the Maricopa Regional Continuum of Care, which includes stakeholders region-wide, and then the Regional Council, which includes all of the elected leadership, the mayors um, and, and the governors of the Native Nations um, and, the, um, and the county supervisor as well. So um, I think these conversations are important. And I think it's helping people to understand the different roles that they can play in this work and the different opportunities that their communities might have. That's why it was very important for us to be able to, um, uh, to conduct a study of the considerations that communities need to take when they're implementing new programs. Because we understand that some communities will be implementing programs perhaps for the first time ever. And they're going to need support and technical assistance in order to make those efforts successful. And so we stand ready to, to assist all, all communities in accessing that full range of choices that we have. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, and again, it truly is a, a regional um, effort, again, as, I noted that one gentleman quoted, said, I'm not houseless, I, I'm not homeless, I'm houseless. And um, so I think people feel attached to parts of the region and not just the city of Phoenix. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor, may I make one more comment? Please do. Great, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, just wanted to, um, to 
comment back on Council Member Pastor's comments. Really appreciate her, her, her direction in that regard. Um, so two thoughts on that. One, around the pets. This, the city of Phoenix really is, is presenting a great model that others in, in the region can, can take forward, particularly with the launch of that new program on May 1st. It's a great way to utilize existing resources and to repurpose them. Um, so very, very excited to see that launch and, and hope to really lift that up to other communities as, as an example to follow. Just yesterday, actually, we're meeting with the municipal human services directors and talking about pets and a number of communities um, volunteered to to come together to learn from each other Chandler Tempe Glendale for example in in addition to the city of Phoenix to really learn from each other and how can we um, remove the barrier um, that people may potentially face if they don't want to enter shelter or housing without their pets and so there's a commitment I think to work regionally on this and to learn from each other and to be able to do more together as a result. Also in terms of um, putting the meat on the plan, fully agree. Uh, we are excited about delving into the tactics. Those will be added to the regional portfolio that will be forwarded just next month and then we'll have a full robust implementation plan that will include extensive implementation plans for each strategy then as it moves forward and that will be completed and offered for approval in August. So I understand we appreciate your patience. We understand that there's been a lot of um, research, a lot of discussion, and we are getting to the point now where we can start taking action together in, in this coordinated regional approach. And we're thankful to the city of Phoenix for being such an incredible partner in all of this work. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Councilman Noah Kemp. Uh, Mayor, um, I'd just like to say hi to Amy. It was about 13 years ago. It was my <laughs> First assignment to MAG that she's our, our person in charge. And basically, we, we were having the same conversations 13 years ago that we're having today. And it's gone such a long, a far way. I mean, we we really talked, we always talked about a regional approach, but I feel that it's the leadership of this council and especially yourself, Mayor, that has really put a plan together. And that plan has been moving on and we've been putting resources and services around it. And I think that's the key is making sure that you have services that surround those individuals that need help and and basically just walk them through the process, being those navigators to help them through their their crises that they're finding themselves at the moment. And exactly what um, Council Member Deborah Starts was talking about is that a lot of people do want to live in those neighborhoods. They still want to go back to their old neighborhood that their kids go to school, they worked at and they had relationships with, but during those hard times, sometimes they end up being houseless. And I like that term. And then we, we need to figure out how to bring those individuals back into a home, back into the communities that they served and worked at and, and built those relationships in. And I think that the plan that you all have done and staff, I mean, it's just incredible that if we continue staying focused on that, um, I think that this whole regional approach will become reality not just a document that we talk about, but actually it looks like it's it's moving in the right direction. And once again, thank you, Amy, for all your all the years of service and, and all your hard work in, in this matter. Thank you very much, Council Member. It's a pleasure to see you and I wish you well in your next adventures. Thank you. Thank you. Any final comments from my colleagues? On this matter or any matter? I, I will turn, um, as soon as we finish Amy's presentation, I will turn to final comments okay. in general. Um, but on homelessness uh, and the general need for affordable housing, thank you, Amy. We know this problem is only growing larger and we need solutions in every corner of Maricopa County. If you look at the eviction map, it is in every corner of Maricopa County. It does, um, and we appreciate the regional collaboration. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, with that, I will conclude that agenda item and turn to Councilman Nowakowski for a final comment. Um, Mayor, I just really want to thank uh, my chief of staff, Felicita Mendoza. She's been with me for the last 13 years. And prior to that, she actually worked for the uh, Cesar Chavez Foundation for five years. So we've known each other and worked with each other for over 18 years. So thank you, Feli, for everything you do. Um, Basically, you run the office and most of the people think you're the councilwoman. So, you know, um, thank you. And I know that you're going to do good for the city of Phoenix, Uber, and all my past council members from 
you know, from Ruben to Layla to Cynthia Aguilar, you know, thank you guys for everything you've done to make this a better place to live for our families and for the residents of the city of Phoenix. God bless y'all. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Council Vice Mayor Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I too want to thank uh, Senior Mathis, my chief of staff, and Andrea Gaston. They are outstanding. They have dealt with one problem right after another and always found solutions that work for everybody. I know they're well respected. They are very professional. And in the past, I've had some other uh, staff that has really worked. Patrick was well known, loved by constituents. Uh, Judy Lodge was very good at the job. And I just thank them all and all staff for working with my office. You made a difference in people's lives. So thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Williams and Councilman Nowakowski for your service. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you, Mayor.